Reaction Beanie Yo 315 Date that neighborhood My brothers and sisters We're about to go back to a channel today y'all That I just feel like is the most Neglected channel So to speak over here that we watch man Like it has been months since we last went to this channel And it's not because this channel is not good It's not because this channel is so apart Like his channel is amazing I love his content it's just the fact that we have to go watch the Y Files and that chapter and Mr. Fall, and then we be watching True 911 Calls, Coffee House Crime, Viral Crimes, Lazy Masquerade, Anna Souls, Dial Trill, Evil Intentions. Like, we got a lot of channels that we watch over here, man. But I feel like this channel is so overdue for us to get into another one of his videos. So, that's what we're about to do right now. And that channel is Just Thought Lounge. Just Thought Lounge, y'all. In the title of the video, The Murder of Jessica Morrison. Now, I never heard of Jessica Morrison. Like, I don't know anything about her story or nothing like that. But even before we get into the video, I just want to go ahead and say, rest in peace to Jessica Morrison. And before we get into the video, my brothers and sisters, y'all know what y'all got to do. Get whatever you may need. Get what you need. We back to Just Thought Lounge. And it has been a while, my brothers and sisters. Y'all got what y'all need. Y'all ready to go? Then let's fucking go. On an early summer evening in rural Tennessee, a man and his dog were out for a walk when they came across a grim discovery. A young mother killed and then abandoned on the roadside. Dang. Her identity was unknown, but that would not stay the case for very long. The investigation that followed uncovered significant evidence pointing to just one somewhat unlikely suspect. But there was far more to this case that was yet to emerge. Years later, even the seemingly indisputable proof became questionable and misleading. And mm. new theories of the crime just kept appearing. Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. Here at JTL, we deliver serious, well-balanced coverage of the cases that really make you think. Today's case offers up a lot to contemplate. There are quite a few players, multiple personal accounts, a tight timeline, contradicting physical evidence, and at the heart of the case, a young victim that no one had reason to harm. Let's take a look. Get whatever you may need. Green County sits on the eastern border of the state of Tennessee. About seven miles from the town of Greenville is the small community of Afton, set in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. It is a rural area dominated by open landscapes and scattered homes. On the evening of the 12th of August, 2016, Donald Kahn Jr., a local resident, was taking his dog for a walk on Judd Neal Loop, a short one-lane circle that had about four or five houses. It was not frequently traveled. It was about 7.30 p.m. when Donald wandered towards the creek on the side of the road. According to Donald, people sometimes dumped trash and animal carcasses down the creek on the loop. But on that evening, someone had left more than an animal carcass in the woods. There, lying next to two trees and near to a barbed wire fence, he came across a woman's body. Donald stood at least six feet away. He saw no need to approach her for a clearer view. A call to 911 was placed upon his return home, bringing local law enforcement, followed by the TBI, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, out to Judd Neal Loop. And y'all know I like to say this, but can you imagine 
Can you imagine? I love to say, can you imagine? But I was just imagining it. Walking upon, like you in the middle of the fucking woods. You know what I'm saying? The last thing you expect to see is a dead body. Can you imagine walking up and seeing that while you and your dog just out for a scroll in the middle of the woods? Like that would just fuck me up. That is something that I will remember for the rest of my life. That moment in time, me walking up and seeing that that is a dead person right there. That would just, ugh. Oh my God, man. Can you imagine? Green County Sheriff's Department Detective James Randolph arrived on scene at roughly 9.30 p.m., two hours after Donald had made the discovery. The detective observed that the victim was a younger woman. She appeared to have suffered significant head trauma and had reddish brown stains on her clothing. He also found that she had bruises on her arms, cuts on her hands, and what appeared to be a broken finger. It was deduced that the wooded area where she was found was not likely where she had been killed. There was no identification on the victim, but only hours later, a concerned mother and a fiance turned up at the Greenville police station. 21-year-old oh. Jessica Morrison had been missing since that afternoon. The young mother of two had left her boys aged one and three with their grandmother and had not returned home. She had been 16 weeks pregnant. Wow. Jessica Morrison had been identified by the photos of her tattoos that her mother, Tammy, had shown to police at the station that night. Tammy and Jessica's fiance, Gary Ely, had sought out police assistance at about midnight, following hours of being unable to reach Jessica by phone or ascertain her whereabouts. They were initially told it was too soon to make a missing persons report. Jessica had only been missing for a few hours at that point, not days. But unfortunately, their worst fears about Jessica's well-being had materialized when law enforcement realized Jessica was the victim discovered out on Judd Neal Loop. An autopsy revealed that Jessica had died as a result of multiple blunt force injuries to the head. She also had abrasions and contusions to the chest and back, and the ring finger on her right hand was fractured. Investigators deduced that the blows had been delivered by a tire iron, or something similar, but the murder weapon was not located. Law enforcement began scouring the area in case a weapon had been discarded in the vicinity. In doing so, they discovered items of potential significance scattered on the roadside. On Tyne Gray Road, they found a pair of shorts, a diaper, and paperwork related to Jessica's eldest son's doctor's appointment. He had just undergone oral surgery that morning. Searching Babs Mill Road, investigators found pieces of Jessica's cell phone cover, a medical wristband with her child's name printed on it, pieces of her driver's license, a pack of Marlboro cigarettes, and a bag of cereal. Additional items such as medical paperwork for the three-year-old was found scattered on Betsy Ross Road. That was about three miles from Judd Neal Loop. Okay, why all this shit getting found, like, scattered about in the vicinity of where all her body was found? And it's a large vicinity if you just look at where all this shit was found. Like, I don't, I, that's weird, man. Why was all these, like, why? I, I can't put my finger on that. But one thing I will say, no pun intent, intended when I say this, but speaking of fingers, did y'all hear when uh, Kevin said that her wedding finger was the one that was fractured? And not just that and the fact that she was beating like this, like beating with that tire iron like this, is making me, is leading me to believe that whoever did this was fucking, they was pissed off at her. It's one thing to just been a choke to the death for something like that, suffocate her or something like that. It's another thing when you beat her to death and you made sure that you broke her ring finger. So long story short, short story long, it sounded like this was a guy who was in love with this woman, but she went in love with him. I could be wrong. I could be wrong, but that's what it sounded like. Tammy and Gary told police that they had already been tracking down Jessica's movements that day. The last person to see her alive, they said, was her eldest son's grandmother, Vonda Smith. Vonda's son, William Smith, 
had a short-lived relationship with Jessica several years earlier. The result of their two to three week fling was three-year-old Channing. William has stated that the two had not been together romantically since. William Smith, he the one who did it. I bet you, I bet you. How much you wanna bet? <laughs> Although William and Jessica had long since ended their relationship, Vonda, the proud grandmother, had been a regular presence in the lives of Jessica and her two boys. When Jessica could not be reached, Tammy went out to Vonda's. There, she found her grandsons in Vonda's care, but Jessica had been dropped off at home hours earlier, Vonda said. Tammy said she felt that something was off. There had been tension between Vonda and both Gary and Tammy for some time. Jessica had arranged for Vonda to babysit her children that weekend, but according to Gary, Jessica had canceled those plans last minute, and the older woman had not been pleased. Tammy and Gary agreed one thing about Vonda. She inserted herself too forcefully into the lives of the boys. This is what they told law enforcement on the night of Jessica's death. Hmm. It was 2 a.m. by the time detectives arrived at the home Vonda Smith shared with her husband Roger on Davis Valley Road. It was roughly three to four miles from the loop where Jessica had been discovered. Detective Randolph and his colleague recorded the interview conducted with the grandmother that night. The detective had the unenviable task of telling Vonda that the mother of her grandson was found dead. When you talk to you for just a moment, right? we got we got we got the information. Mm -hmm. And Jess is dead? Yes, yes. I did not see her. He asked Vonda to explain when she had last seen or spoken to Jessica. Vonda did not, as Tammy had claimed, state that she had driven Jessica to her home. She instead told the detectives that Jessica had turned up at her work at about 1 p.m. that afternoon, asking for help with the boys. The youngest, Camden, only one year old, was acting out. She couldn't do anything with him, Vonda stated. The 50-year-old had been an insurance clerk at Laughlin Hospital for 25 years, but her family was her top priority. So when Jesse showed up that day, she left work and the two went to Food City to buy groceries for her and the boys. The trip was subsequently confirmed by video surveillance captured at the store between 3.07 and 3.43 that afternoon. The bags of groceries were then dropped off at the home Jessica shared with her fiancé Gary and his father, J.D. Ely. The unpacked bags were left untouched when Tammy arrived at Jesse and Gary's later that day looking for her daughter. But what had become of Jessica after that? Vonda told Detective Randolph that Jessica was also behind on other bills, so Vonda gave Jessica money and the keys to her car. How much money would you give her to buy? Same house. I paid to have her lights turned on. They cut her lights off one day. I had to go get off from work. Go get the boys. They turned her lights off. How long did that be? It's all the time. She ran through quite a bit. And I, it wasn't that I cared, but I couldn't let those two boys or her do without. Ma'am, you're right. I give her the money, and then she went to pay bills. I know she said she was going to pay her car. She said her rent, and then the phone minutes. So, how did she leave? In my car. And that was the last time I physically saw her. Jessica left in her white Pontiac Sunfire to pay her bills. Then, at about 6.30 p.m., Vonda's car was returned to her, parked at the end of the drive outside of her house. Vonda told the detectives that she observed a white van pull up at the same time. She saw a man, whom she assumed was Gary Ely, get out of the car and into the white van. And like I said, also, my van... And all you know is the van was here and the car was here, but you don't know how your car got here. Like I said, I did not see them, literally see them, when they bought my car. 
The detectives asked Vonda's permission to search her car, which she gave, but with a warning. The interior, she said, smelt of cat urine. Her sister-in-law, Peggy, owned a cat that had relieved itself in the front passenger seat earlier in the week. Vonda had subsequently bleached the seats, but the smell, she said, lingered. Cat, yes. Yes. It stinks. And like I said, we clean it. The house? The car. Oh, you clean the house. The cat is not in it. When did that happen? Wednesday. Wednesday you cleaned it? Oh. So not tonight. Mm -hmm. Looking at the white sun fire, they noticed reddish brown stains on the seat, console, and the corner of the passenger side windshield. Detective Randolph also noticed a circular pattern on the passenger side window, perhaps caused by someone wiping the glass to clean it. Okay, I, I, I was starting to believe Vonda. Ain't that the lady name, Vonda? I was starting to believe her that that she really ain't had nothing to do with uh, Jesse demise, death, whatever you want to call it. But this lady sat up here and said, that you gonna smell some cat piss. If you smell something strange, it's cat piss. Well, fuck, it, it, um, Vonda. We, I'm talking to Vonda right now, even though she never hear this. But Vonda, do you know smelling is just one sense that we have? We also can see shit. And you clearly can see that that don't look like no cat piss. That look like some dried up blood stains, lady. I was starting to believe her because when when they, she said we went to the store because uh, I wanted to buy her groceries and all that for her and her kids. And then they actually had footage of it. I'm like, okay, this lady telling the truth. But then we get to this part now. I'm like, okay, this lady is fucking lying. I don't, I, I just, I, I don't know who, I'm, I'm still not convinced. I don't know who the fuck killed her so far. I don't know if it's the current husband, the ex-husband. I don't freaking know. But... The main thing I'm wondering is why? Why? The car was taken back to the lab where TBI processed it, and what they found was blood. DNA analysis confirmed it was Jessica's. It was unclear what, if anything relevant, was discovered inside of the house, but the state of Vonda Smith's car was damning body of a 21-year-old white female, Jessica Morrison, was discovered along the side of the road on Judd Neal Loop. A joint investigation by special agents with the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation and the Greene County Sheriff's Department has resulted in an indictment of an Afton woman on two counts of murder, first degree. This week, the Greene County Grand Jury returned an indictment charging the grandmother, Vonda Starr Smith, that is the grandmother of Jessica's child. Holy shit! Holy shit, y'all. I was not expecting this because I wasn't thinking like this. I'm thinking Vonda may have something to actually do with it. But I'm not thinking she the one who actually did it. Is that a possibility, my brothers and sisters? Is she the one who physically beat Vonda that much? Let's go. The blood evidence in the car had led investigators to a theory of the crime, supported by the correspondence they found between Vonda and Jessica when analyzing Vonda's cell phone. The grandmother had grown accustomed to caring for Jessica's two boys regularly, sometimes three to four days a week. But more recently, Jessie had been keeping them at home or with her other family members. Having patched up her rocky relationship with her mother, she had also been canceling time with Vonda in favor of spending more time at Tammy's. That weekend, Jessica had yet again abruptly canceled plans to have both boys stay with Vonda. Detectives believed that this was the trigger. After all of the help Vonda continued to provide to Jessie, and she was being denied time with the boys. 
I'm sure she wanted to keep the boy. And Jesse told her no. He had had surgery that morning. And I guess it just got out of hand. There were arguably a few inconsistencies with the state's theory. Perhaps the most glaring was that Jessica had been the victim of a sustained and brutal attack consisting of multiple blunt force blows. Her own defensive wounds indicated that she had put up quite a fight. Vonda's defense questioned whether she was even physically capable of this act. And that's what I'm saying when I was saying that. Like, is it possible that Vonda actually beat this woman to death? Because if you look at both of them, you would think that Jesse could pretty much easily get the upper hand on Vonda just because of Vonda's age and, uh, you know, her size. She's a little more overweight. I And I can't imagine that Vonda was able to do that. I'm thinking more like a male. That's why I was saying the husband or the ex-husband or somebody. I don't know. Vonda ass might be a, 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 a low-down, murderous motherfucker, my brothers and sisters. But let's just keep going. 52-year-old Vonda Smith stood two inches shy of five feet in height. That is 147 centimeters. Vonda was also in admittedly poor health and overall physical condition. 21-year-old Jessica Morrison, conversely, was in good health and was five foot six inches tall. There had been no drugs or alcohol in her system, only a small amount of caffeine. Furthermore, Detective Randolph observed no scratches or bruising anywhere on Vonda Smith when he visited her home on the night of the murder. Could Vonda have committed this brutal murder without leaving a single mark visible anywhere on her body? I don't think so, man. It got to be one of them dudes, man. It got to be a male or, or, or a, a bigger, younger female. This is one of the most goddamn confusing cases I done watched in a while. Where I don't know it all. I don't know. Key to Vonda's defense was the ability to corroborate key elements of her story. First, that she had provided both cash and her car to Jessica after their grocery shop at roughly 4 p.m. If Vonda had given Jessica $1,000 to pay her bills that evening, this cash was unaccounted for. Mm. Investigators found that no bills had been paid. Indeed, her rent and utilities were not overdue, as Vonda had stated. Nevertheless, there were only a few cents discovered in Jessica's pocket when she was found. The money, mm. if it had existed, was gone. Vonda's defense presented a series of witnesses that called into question the timeline of events that day. First, two of Jessica's neighbors, Edward Hitchens and Jason Matthews, each independently seemed to confirm that Jessica had been at home at around 5 to 5.30 that day. And crucially, that a white van, similar to the one Vonda had reported seeing, was present at her property. Edward testified that he saw two men inside a white van at roughly this time. Jason then testified that he saw Jessica arrive home in a car at about 5 p.m. and then get into a white van. So who owned a white van that could have been seen by Jason at Jessica's house that evening? It seems that Gary's father, J.D. Ely, had spent the day with a friend, a man named Dudley Hudson. And Dudley, it turns out, owned an older work van, white in color, and was driving it with JD that day. Mm. JD told the police that he and Dudley stopped by the home around 4.30 or 5 p.m. When he testified in court, however, he revised this to 3 p.m. Each of the two friends, JD and Dudley, provided each other with an alibi that accounted for their movements throughout the full day and evening of August 12th. However, JD's credibility was questioned when he was asked about drug activity and weapons charges pending against him from the previous year. On the stand, JD took the Fifth Amendment against self-incrimination in response to these questions. He also claimed that he did not have drugs in his system on the day Jessica was killed. Vonda's defense also sought to verify her claims that she cleaned her car days before the blood was discovered inside it, not the night of the murder. 
Peggy Carter, Vonda's sister-in-law, told the jury that while Vonda was visiting with her and her husband the previous weekend, they saw her cat exiting the Pontiac Sunfire. Peggy told them that the cat had probably sprayed the car. She said that the cat had done this on other occasions, and she later had a conversation with Roger about removing the smell. She told him to try using some bleach. The bleaching of the bloodstains certainly suggested that Vonda was trying to cover her tracks. However, Vonda maintained that there was no blood in the car when she used it again that evening. See, that's what I'm saying, man. This is why Vonda's story really not making no damn sense to me. Or end of this story, well, not end of this story, this is this the, the, the problem that I'm having with this story. When we talking about the white van and that Jessica got out of Vonda car and got in a white van with the two men. Even if that is the case, that is not explaining why, why Jessica damn blood stains are in your car, Vonda. Even if it's true that she got out and got in there with them. Why? How? When? What? Tell me something about these blood stains that has came back to be Jesse's in your car. Can, can, we, can we get that explanation from somebody, please? At roughly 7 p.m. on the 12th, Vonda arrived driving her Sunfire at the home of a woman named Sharon Bergner. Sharon was also a grandmother. She and Vonda were friendly. Sharon's home was about 20 miles from Vonda's house, and the drive would usually take about 40 minutes. Vonda arrived to collect Sharon's granddaughter, nine-year-old Emma. Emma was the daughter of her son William's girlfriend. Mm. Sharon Bergner testified that she and Vonda discussed a cat having urinated in the car at Aunt Peg's. Grossed out by this, Emma retrieved a towel upon which to sit when she got into the passenger seat. Sharon stood on both sides of the car during their interaction, and Emma had climbed inside. Crucially, both claimed that there were no blood stains visible to them at 7pm that night. She would not have allowed young Emma to get into the car had she seen blood stains on the seats, Sharon said. Yet, this interaction occurred only a half an hour before Jessica was discovered on the loop. If the car had been used to transfer her, the stains had to have already been there. Yeah. DNA samples collected from Jessica also painted a murky picture. The TBI found that there were at least three different DNA profiles, all determined to be male, found under Jessica's fingernails. These samples were limited, meaning finding an exact match would be difficult, but they were nonetheless tested against men with known connections to Jessica. These were her two young boys, Vonda's husband Roger Smith, Vonda's son William Smith, as well as her fiancé Gary, his father J.D. Ely, and J.D.'s friend Dudley Hudson. All of these men were excluded as sources of the fingernail DNA. Similarly, there was an unknown male profile found on her discarded driver's license. Where there was a female DNA profile identified on the discarded items, testing against Vonda Smith excluded her as the source. Fingerprints lifted from the car were also ambiguous. A print lifted from the visor matched to Vonda, but that's not strange, it was her car. True. Even more curiously, there was sperm found on Jessica's underwear from at least two individuals. And what an additional fuck? swab from that area also contained two male profiles. What the fuck? Oh my God. So it, that, I think that pretty, we can go ahead and confirm at least this much, my brothers and sisters. The, the whole white van thingy, the two men in the white van, we can pretty much confirm that, that, is, that that's what happened. Now, I still can't explain how her blood ended up in Von the car, but for sperm to be found on her underwear by two different men, that right there, come on now. Come on now. So the white van shit is I want I, I wanna I wanna confirm that like I'm 95%. I put 95% sure on that theory now. This shit still got me confused as fuck. Like I don't know what to believe. 
One of these was a match to Gary, the fiance. The sample also, by extension, matched JD, since they are father and son. But the second male sample remained unidentified. Bizarrely, given the circ... Okay, maybe I was just wrong about everything I just said then, goddammit. Cause I I ain't think about that the damn sperm could be the father and by extension it can uh well it can be the fiance and by extension it can match the father. I ain't know all that man. I'm confused as fuck. Long story short, short story long, y'all, and I just think we not gonna know who did this. But I got a theory that I'm gonna get well that theory probably gonna be stupid too. But let's just keep going. Circumstances, the TBI did not conduct a paternity test to determine the father of Jessica's third pregnancy. Mm. Gary, as well as others, assumed the child to be his. Tammy Morrison testified at Vonda's trial, however, that Gary and Jessica had broken up for a period of two months in March of that year, four to five months before her death. A blood spatter expert determined two things to be true of the blood stains found in Vonda's car. That the car was only used to transport Jesse. It was not the site of her death. And that the blood was not planted after the fact. This was determined by the placement of the stains, which appeared to have formed from a figure Jessica's size seated in the passenger seat. This would have been almost impossible to fake later. The blood was also found to have been mixed with cleaning products, primarily bleach. The only explanation was that someone had tried to clean the blood after Jessica had been in the car. Whether she was the one who delivered the blows or not, Vonda had almost certainly been the one to clean the car. This could not have taken place earlier in the week, as she had claimed. The possibility of an accomplice never came up at trial. The murder weapon was never found, and the exact location of the killing has not been determined. Vonda did not take the stand in her own defense. On the 25th of May, 2018, a Greene County Criminal Court jury found Vonda Star Smith guilty of one count of first-degree murder for Jessica Morrison's death and one count of second-degree murder relating to the death of her unborn child. Judge John F. Duggar Jr. sentenced her to a life prison term. She wow. would be considered for parole after serving 51 years, making her sentence an effective life term. Vonda was also handed an additional 25 years for the second degree murder charge, though the sentences are to be served concurrently. Wow. Now see, I like this judge. I like this uh, judicial system they got going on over here. They not playing with Von Dad. Not only we gonna give you life, but we gonna give you 50 years plus another 25 on top. And that, that basically mean that your ass gonna ride in this bitch till you die. Now see, we'll get into all that later. Let's just keep going with the story. I'll say all that later. But I am, I, props to them, man, for giving her the, 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 the hammer slammer kabama. While Vonda prepared to appeal her conviction, the case caught the interest of criminal defense attorney and television personality Ron Kuby. The attorney is famous for taking on cases of questionable convictions and having them successfully overturned. His investigation into the case of Vonda Smith raised questions about her guilt and suggested that she may have been covering for someone else. Vonda's mm. appeal pointed to the DNA, which was found under Jesse's fingernails, and to various unidentified fingerprints found on the physical evidence. Her team argued that the evidence shows, at most, that her car was used to transport Jessica's body, but not that she perpetrated the fatal beating. The state presented no evidence that Vonda was injured, despite the evidence of a violent attack against which Jessie fought for her life. And see, Kevin just said it then. That's what I was going to say, y'all. I'm going to wait till we get to the very end of the video. But I might as well speak on it now. That's the most plausible thing that I can come up with. And it's it just hard for me to believe it. What I'm saying is, what I believe, but my theory would be, that Vonda is not the one who did it. She know who did it. Whoever did it, used her car to do it, all that and that. And she know all about it. But she trying to cover up for whoever did do it. 
And that's the hardest thing for me to grasp that you would cover up somebody else's murder to the point where you would go to prison for the rest of your life for somebody else fucking murder. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's hard for me to believe. Like, my brothers and sisters, would y'all go to fucking prison? I don't give a damn if it's your son, your mama, your sister, your brother, anybody in your family, anybody that you love, will you go spend the rest of your damn life in prison because of something they did and cover up for it? That's the hardest part for me believe, to believe, but at the same time, it's the only thing I can believe. Vonda ass know who did it. She just won't say nothing, and she re willing to just destroy and just... In not physically, but something wordily, the rest of her life just for who I think may be her son to get away with this. Let's go. Fonda also argued the evidence showed that she loved Jessica like a daughter and she had no motive to kill her. Fonda's appeal was denied. Good. Afterwards, she spoke with Ron Kuby and his team. She said it wasn't Gary Ely that she saw dropping off her car that evening with the white van after all. She had accepted that Gary had an alibi. He was at work until at least 7 p.m. In a bombshell accusation offered too late to help her defense, Vonda now claims that the man she saw with her car that night was her son, William. Oh, now, really? We got this later to the video, y'all. And now, 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 it all makes sense. And now, Vonda, now that you, it finally has hit your ass. It finally has hit your ass that you finna go down for something that your goddamn son did. You tried to cover it up. You tried your best. You was willing to goddamn go to court and be charged with this and keep your mouth closed all this time until it got real in the field when you when they denied you a, an appeal come on now let's get a little little rhyme in on it let's put a little bar in on that bitch now your ass realize how real it is and you trying to blame your son lady you should have been told them folks it was your goddamn son from the beginning Those close to Vonda, including Aunt Peggs and Grandma Sharon, insist she is innocent of the murder. Multiple character witnesses testified to her calm temperament and loving nature. Vonda's husband Roger and son William remain confused by her more recent claims. Tammy Morrison has since had her own encounter with law enforcement, as has J.D. Ely, who is currently serving time in a federal prison for drug charges. In addition to the investigative dive performed by Ron Kuby and his team, there has been a book published by local residents, and many blogs created, arguing passionately for Vonda's innocence. And that was the tragic story of Jessica Morrison and the conviction of Vonda Smith. Thanks for watching. I'm Kevin. This is Just Thought Lounge, and I'll see you in the next one. And we'll see you too, Just Thought Lounge. We got to start coming back to your channel more often. I'm going to make sure of that, man. But this one right here, my brothers and sisters, is one of the most confusing, not confusing like I don't know what's going on, but confusing like I don't know who fucking did it cases that we have watched in a long time. Like, who did it? Who did it? And I, I'm just going to go with the theory, y'all. I just feel like this is the most plausible theory. When you look at all the evidence, you look at everything that happened, Vonda basically tried to cover up for her damn son. That's just what I'm going with. But I can't even I can't even say I'm 100% sure that that's what it is. But because of all these other different factors and all this and that and all these other people involved, so if you wanted to make the 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 the, the case that it was um 
her actual current boyfriend or the ex-boyfriend or Vonda or this or that. I can't really be mad at you on this one because this evidence is not concrete. The one thing I will say though, I feel like Vonda ass should be charged with this. You know what I'm saying? Like, even if she didn't do it, she need to be charged because if anybody knows who did it, it is her. Yo ass sitting up here talking about that it gonna smell like cat piss, no, cat, cat piss in my car, knowing damn well that that damn lady blood is in your car. So you know what the fuck going on if don't nobody else in the world know what happened to Jessica Morrison and R.I.P. One more time to her, man. Vaughn to know what happened. You know what I'm saying? Her and whoever did it, because I don't believe she did it. I believe she know who did it, but I don't believe she did it. But like I said, my brothers and sisters, if any if any theory y'all got, man, I'm not going to say you wrong. Matter of fact, man, y'all comment, man. Let me know who y'all think did this shit, because... This one, like I said, and I'm, I'm going to repeat myself now. Any way you go with it, man, it's kind of plausible. It's kind of plausible. But I digress. Just out loud, like I said earlier too, man, we most definitely come back to your channel, bro, because that was great. Appreciate y'all coming on back, my brothers and sisters. Y'all make sure y'all hit that like button, comment, and subscribe if you ain't on, the, on your way out the door. And please come back tomorrow. For some more of these reaction videos. And until I see y'all tomorrow, y'all know I gotta say this love, peace, and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.